Welcome to this event. It's wonderful to see all of you. We're not going to take a lot of time with introductions because we really want to listen to our panelists and undertake a discussion with you. But a few more words that before I move. Thank you all for coming. I would like to um, thank the students of Dr. Maya Matarik's lab who have created this wonderful interactive showcase. Great, great work. And of course, I would like to thank the panelists without whom this event would never come to light. <laughs> and I also would like to say that this event is the result of a strong collaboration between us in the libraries, the Visions and Voices team, and the event planning team, and in particular, special thanks to Tyson Gaskell. Where are you, Tyson? Over there. Hey, Tyson. Thank you. So now, over to Curtis, who will introduce our panelists. Hey everyone. So we have uh, a stellar lineup for you this afternoon to um, talk to us and with us about these interesting, engaging, and complicated issues. Um, to my right is Jonathan Gratch, who is a professor in Viterbi and also the director of the Virtual Human Research Lab at uh, ICT here at USC, the Institute for Creative Technologies. Uh, to his right, and speaking second, is Sidney DeMello who is in the Department of uh, Computer Science and Cognitive Science at the University of Colorado Boulder. And then to his right is Rachel Severson, who is in the Department of Psychology at the University of Montana and also directs the Minds Lab. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna give a, a brief rundown of how the format's gonna go. So. Um, each panelist is going to present for 12 minutes with three minutes after each panelist for any kind of clarifying questions. And then after all three have presented, after the three minutes of clarifying questions, Jonathan, who is going to be also be our moderator, um, will present uh, and introduce each panelist. And Jonathan's going to present first. So Jonathan, over to you. Okay, so we have a, a great panel today, and we're going to talk about various aspects of emotion and emotion and artifacts. And uh, one of the questions that will um, come up is, how does this impact how we see ourselves as human? And so I'll touch on some of those issues, but also talk about why machines ultimately will have to have something like emotion. Um, now, you know, humans are often concerned with what it means to be human, and usually that is defined in reference to some other group. Uh, so traditionally throughout our history, we've tended to define ourselves against animals and try to show how we are uh, unique of all animals and having certain traits. And so people are very good at coming up with nice dichotomies and identifying certain traits that are more important and, and, and better that we associate with ourselves and then associate other tra traits with the out group, and that includes human out groups, so groups that we don't necessarily like or are competing with will uh, remove certain traits from them and assign them more animalistic traits. Um, now we're in an interesting time because we have a new out group to compare ourselves with, and uh, in many ways the concern is that AI is threatening our traditional notion of what makes us special as people. Uh, that we, One of the things we, we admire about ourselves is our intelligence, our intellect, and now these machines are coming along and crushing us and what do we do about it? But uh, being inventive humans, we're very good at coming up with new dichotomies uh, to identify traits about ourselves that are distinguish ourselves from machines. And in particular, uh, what we'll talk about today is one of the things that we see as distinguishing ourselves from machines is that we have emotions and we're creative. Um, and actually, uh, different than these kind of things. And just a, an example, there was recently a, uh, if there's any Koreans in the audience, you probably know Go is a very important game in Korea. Uh, and recently, AlphaGo beat the Korean grandmaster, and there were some psychologists studying identity at the time, and they were able to show that uh, there was a shift in values that people in Korean society identified as being important after this match, which is they elevated more the importance of emotion and creativity. Um, but I think that's going to be a short-term strategy because we're actually at the dawn of an age, I would say, where machines are becoming sophisticated in the emotion realm. Um, and so Sydney, for 
younger version of Sydney up here, uh, <laughs> will talk some about uh, how machines can recognize emotion and in, in, uh, in people and, and help them do certain tasks like learn better. Uh, some of the work we do at my lab at ICT, we use emotion technology actually to teach people emotional skills, like how to um, uh, negotiate better or recognize emotions in other people. You saw some work about aut autism out in the robot world next door. Um, but also, companies are getting very good at manipulating emotion uh, and using various techniques to get us to buy more stuff or spend more time on Facebook, for example. Uh, of course, if you're an artist, you probably recognize that creativity is now becoming the realm of computers as well, and they're doing tr traditional arts that we've up to now seen as requiring human creativity. Um, and this was actually foreshadowed uh, from the beginning of AI. Uh, so some of the early leaders uh, of artificial intelligence argued that any intelligent machine must have something like emotion. Uh, Herb Simon, uh, one of the founders of AI, along with Alan Newell, uh, in developing their work, they were influential in developing general theories of human of intelligence in general. Uh, and, and uh, he argued that that machines need something that performs the function that emotion performs in people in order to be able to work and adapt in complex environments. And so what I want to highlight in the brief time I have is three key functions that emotion serves in people and illustrate how those functions are important for machines and how machines are beginning to enact those various functions. Um, the first is that emotion is crucial for how we make decisions. Um, so emotion is really kind of a framework that allows people to think about how their goals are doing in response to events that are occurring in the environment. And so just to give an example, uh, imagine I have a goal, I want to be a mad scientist, uh, and I take my first class in college, my first math test comes back with the F mark on it. Um, and so what emotion is a system that helps me evaluate the significance of that event for my goal of being a mad scientist, in particular, uh, it's argued that we judge these events along different dimensions. Is it good or bad? Probably not so good. Uh, did I expect it or can I control the circumstance? Well, it may depend. If I think I'm uh, really good at math, I would probably be surprised at this outcome and uh, wonder how I could control it in the future. And then in terms of causal attribution, who do I blame? Do I blame the teacher oh, as an unfair test or do I blame myself? And so based on these pattern of judgments, that will tend to evoke certain emotions in us that may be expressed on our face, but also change our physiology. Um, but further, emotion is part of a system that helps us prepare for what to do about that. And so if, for example, I view this as a situation that's controllable, uh, that I, I think I can do something about it, then I may go out in the world and try to change something to make my goal still true. So I may go find a tutor to get better at math and I'll be, still be able to be a mad scientist. But on the other hand, if I think this event is uncontrollable, uh, I may just give up on this goal and decide to join a rock band, right? Um, now, if you look at these things, desirability, expectedness, if you're an AI person, these are familiar terms. These are actually concepts that we use in AI all the time. They're things like utility, probability, how do I construct a plan to achieve a goal, who do I assign uh, blame for an action that occurs, uh, how do I decide when I need to give up a goal and move on to a different goal? And how do I prioritize different actions that I might want to take? Um, in fact, these are the, the very functions that Herb Simon argued that any intelligent machine must enact in order to act in an intelligent world. And in fact, uh, people like myself and Sydney who are building models that reason about emotion build on traditional AI techniques but show the relationship between these AI techniques and emotion. Therefore you can then create a working model of emotion and tie it to a robot, for example, and have the robot uh, go about its business and convey that it actually has an act and make decisions in ways that actually as if it has emotion. Um, now, I mentioned also that emotion changes physiology, uh, and there's very important reasons for that. So people uh, have to operate in complex environments with fairly severe energy constraints. Uh, and so we can't just have everything going uh, 100%. You have to make decisions, your body has to make decisions about what to do. And depending on what kind of situation you are in, your physiology essentially rewires itself to act in different ways. And so if you feel like you can handle this situation, you're challenged, but you can still do it, what you'll see is your heart rate goes up and your capillaries dilate, so oxygen flows throughout your body and you're able to 
to do actions. In fact, if you're angry, you'll see that blood will flow to the muscles in your arms. You're ready to, to take action against other people. On the other hand, if you view a situation as threatening, you'll actually see aspects of your physiology shut down, probably because back in the day, if you got bit by an animal, you don't want to bleed out. So you want to do certain things to prepare your body for threats. Um, and although robots today are, are still fairly simple, you can see aspects of robots having to have a sense of physiology. And probably one of the best examples is uh, deep space spacecraft, because they have severe energy requirements. They have lots of goals. And so this is Cassini. And if you understand the architecture of that spacecraft, you'll know that you can't run everything all the time. You have to make decisions on what to turn on and what to turn off. You actually have heaters to warm up elements of that architecture so that they're ready to do certain actions. And these things all take time. And so you could imagine uh, that basically you need something like a physiology to anticipate what's going to happen in the world so you can reorient and, and, and charge up or change the architecture of this machine so it can operate in the moment that it needs to. Um, Okay, so to summarize, emotion is part of a system that compares our goals to things in the environment and helps us take action. Now, second thing emotion does for people is it communicates something to the social world. Um, so imagine I've got our robot now that has emotion and I see it approaching me on the street and that robot steps on my foot and it smiles, okay? So, you're probably already thinking, well, why would a robot smile? And so if you see an event like that, people actually kind of try to reconstruct what's an explanation for why uh, somebody shows a certain emotion. It's a kind of form of mind reading. And you might imagine if a robot smiles after stepping on my foot, it's probably a bad robot, right? Um, and so a more concrete example of this, um, this is a game, Prisoner's Dilemma is a game that was developed by economists to study how people make social decisions. And it's an interesting and kind of devious game. You pay people money. Uh, and to incentivize certain actions. And so the two people together will make the most money if they both cooperate. Um, however, there's an incentive to screw the other person over. And so if you exploit another person, they cooperate, you make more money, which creates a, a temptation to exploit the other person and also a fear that you might be exploited. And if you're a game theorist, the safe thing to do is to not try to cooperate at all. But humans actually don't act like game theorists. And it seems that what people do is they actually read each other's facial expressions in part to solve this coordination problem, to decide whether to cooperate or not. So if you see this woman show this expression, how might that change the way you play the game? Well, if you think about it, it's not sufficient just to know that she smiles. You actually have to know something about the context. So imagine you're playing this game, and she just cooperated with you, and she smiles. That tells you something. Maybe that she actually has the goal of cooperation. She liked that we cooperated together. On the other hand, and then perhaps I should cooperate more with her. But if she just screwed me over, and she shows the same expression, that has a very different meaning, right? So that can communicates that she has the goal of exploiting me, and I probably shouldn't you know, be nice to her anymore. And so the point is that people can make these inferences all the time. They use context and the expression to make mental state inference about what the other person's going to do. And it turns out that we can get machines, and Sydney will talk more about this, to do exactly that. So we have people play that very game with each other. We track their facial expressions, and then we try to uh, predict what the next action will be. And we can show that if you add the facial expressions to the reasoning, you can actually do better at guessing what the other person's going to do. Uh, so in a sense, uh, computers can use these emotion signals as information to make inferences about what people are going to do next. Um, so up to now, I've talked about emotion prepares an entity to act. Emotion acts as uh, information about other people. Uh, the last thing I want to emphasize is emotions are actually tools that we use to manipulate each other. And so if we go back to our example of this evil robot. If it's a really evil robot, what it ought to do is step on my foot and then look guilty. It's, oh, I'm sorry. So it can step on my foot again, right? <laughs> so there it's reasoning about how I'm thinking to change my beliefs about it in ways that benefit itself. And this is something people also actually do all the time. And so one of the ways we tried to look at that was to create these virtual robots that had different patterns of facial expression. And so we could create how they would respond to different events in the game. In this case, it's a robot that smiles after cooperation. We can also create a robot that smiles after screwing you over. And we can show that people are very sensitive to this. So there's an example of a person playing a game with, in this case, a cooperative machine. It smiles when it 
cooperates. Turns out, so she starts out, she actually screws the robot over. It shows it's not very happy about that. Um, the robot then screws her back, but she tries to cooperate. Um, but then it shows, oh, oops, I'm sorry, I'm guilty. Uh, and then she continues to cooperate, and the robot cooperates, and they manage to cooperate together. And then they actually stay in that state for the rest of the game, and they do pretty well. And so we can show experimentally that people are sensitive to that. They pick up on these pattern of expressions, and we can move around to what extent they, what actions they take in these kind of games. So just to kind of wrap up, uh, so what I've tried to argue is to operate effectively in complex social worlds, machines must have something akin to emotion. Um, and I gave you three examples of, of functions that emotions serve in people that emo machines will also have to do. Now, what does this uh, do to our notion of human uniqueness? Um, I think that's a question that's not going to be answered right away, but I'll just say that it's a very old question, and humans have been confronting threats to their identity for many, many years, and we've somehow muddled through. So I'll stop at that point, and we have a little bit of time for questions, and then uh, maybe while I'm doing that, Sydney can go ahead and set up. Yeah, absolutely. My student Sue, sitting right here, has been doing a lot of work there. I mean, one thing I actually she discovered was uh, if you rotate your head, most of these trackers lose your face. And I, I just bought a Subaru uh, that does has face recognition technology. It, it complains at me when I'm not looking at the road, and if I tilt my head, it starts complaining at me. But yeah, in general, uh, black faces, uh, glasses. Uh, turning your head more than 10 degrees off axis from the camera. These are all things that lead, lead these techniques to infer incorrect things. Of course, there's also differences in culture. And so there's a general concern amongst people developing this technology that companies that, you know, Amazon and Google are advertising, hey, you can recognize emotion of your consumers and infer certain things. Police departments are saying, hey, you know, I can detect a bad guy maybe if I can recognize your emotions. And, no, we can't do that, but a, the hype sometimes gets ahead of what the technology can actually do. Okay, why don't we move on to Sydney? Uh, thanks for getting us started, Jonathan. Uh, good afternoon. It's great to be here in uh, some sunshine. We actually are getting reports of snow back in Colorado. It's the, the, sec <laughs> the, the second snow, uh, but it's fun snow. Um, I want to build up, uh, so John talked a lot about uh, machines that uh, are doing reasoning with emotions. Um, and I want to talk to you about uh, a, a related topic, which is machines that actually sense and model human emotions uh, in their decision making, and how this can actually enhance uh, engagement uh, and learning. Uh, and let me, let me start with the story. Um, I, was, I was always, a, I would say, a mediocre uh, high school student. Um, and, but, but my grades were you know, a product of how much I worked. Uh, until I, I took a course in grad school, I mean an undergrad in engineering graphics, and you're supposed to do these, these are called orthographic projections. You're supposed to go from those three-dimensional things to these two-dimensional viewpoints. And for the life of me, I could just not figure this out. 
Um, and I got a tutor, and we would have group tutoring, and they would the everybody else was just getting this naturally, and I just couldn't. Uh, and I had an excellent tutor who just taught me an entirely different way to do this, where you don't visualize anything, because I realized at that point I didn't have a spatial memory, a really good one. Uh, and it got me really interested in, in the power of good human tutoring and how they can actually help people uh, tr you know, go through really, really tough times. Um, so in grad school, I started working. But, but the problem is, how do you give tutors to everybody um, who can't afford them? Uh, this is an old diagram uh, about the hypothesized benefits of human tutoring. So you can see uh, you have computer-aided instruction. You can think about these as the MOOCs. These were very big in the 70s and 80s. They help you learn a little bit. Intelligent tutoring systems that model human tutors are supposed to get you about a letter grade. And we thought that human tutors are this holy grail of one-on-one -on -one tutoring. They get you about two letter grades. Uh, you may notice there's no reading in there. Uh, for, conceptual, for deep conceptual information, a lot of studies have shown that reading and watching lectures is literally equivalent to doing nothing. Uh, we get no differences. Um, so, so we focus on these more interactive uh, types of tutoring. So we started out building these things. Uh, we would record expert human tutors uh, in the wild. We would transcribe everything they said. We understood their emotions, their gestures, their language, and we would build computer models. And, and these models would do really, really well in terms of learning in small experiments, except no student really wanted to interact with them. And when we'd go to collect data in schools, the second time, the third time, the kids would be hiding under the desk, uh, saying, they, say they, saying they, weren't, they didn't want to participate, right? And they were completely missing the whole emotional aspect of learning. Um, and uh, emotions are very critical to learning. This is a 15 second clip um, of a student uh, solving some problems and just going through uh, a roller coaster of emotions. And those are self-reported emotions. Uh, and you always get these smirks and smiles when people are frustrated. Um, so actually, 90% of the time during natural frustration, you get a little smile uh, on the corner of your mouth. So we then, uh, and if you think about why emotions matter in learning, it's just you're, kind of a viewpoint of what happens. So deep learning, conceptual information, you learn deep information when the world breaks down. right? So we're not talking about shallow accumulation of facts. And the core emotion there is that of disequilibrium and confusion. Something is not working, and that's a trigger, just as John was talking about appraisals. My knowledge state is not correct. I need to learn. I need to problem solve. And if you actually succeed, you can have one of these eureka moments or prideful moments and delight. But you can actually turn over and get stuck and get frustrated, and then eventually you start disengaging. So can you have a computer tutor that's teaching somebody the content while also monitoring their emotions. And will that help learning? Um, and we built one. Um, so this was the tutor that taught people the fundamentals of computer literacy. And while the interaction is occurring through natural language dialogue, it's sensing uh, through looking at body movements. So it's actually looking, uh, this is a really old school sensor. This is looking at uh, how they're sitting on a chair. Uh, this is a, a butt sensor. Uh, and you can actually tell a lot of information from posture. Uh, yes, it does look like fMRI. Uh, but <laughs> Um, and we also tracked uh, facial expressions and a lot of information in the content. And what we found was what the tutor would do is if the student was confused, it would give a hint. If the student was frustrated, it would acknowledge the frustration. This is difficult material, but you know, let's keep trying, uh, and so on and so forth. And we found that this, this just minimal type of motivational supports actually help learning and engagement, but specifically for students uh, that were low on prior knowledge. So uh, we then saw that actually, OK, you can have a tutor, you can have some learning, you can have them respond to emotions, but boy, sometimes learning can be darn boring. Uh, in certain topics, it's really hard to focus attention. So here are some videos uh, of people who zone out and mind wander during learning, right? And we occur, this occurs all the time. It's estimated that you mind wander about 50% of the time uh, in everyday life. During reading, it's about 30%. Video lectures, 45 to 50%. Um, and it's really hard to pick out. So one of the things is, we don't evolve, socially I'm evolving to communicate to you that I'm attending to you. And even though my thoughts might be internal, right? So here's an example of a person, um, and most people would agree that she's uh, reading intently in this case. But she's not, she's actually zoning out. <laughs> um, uh, and there are some easy cases. Um, so he's reading intently. Um, 
And most people, if you show these videos to people, uh, they will say, uh, you know, this guy is uh, focused, uh, focused. But you have these interesting cases um, where people have trouble interpreting this interesting gesture. And about half say that he's, he's, att he's attending, half don't. Um, and here's another one uh, where you can look at this. And we can take bets. So, so, so it's not this easy. So I, as sophisticated as we think humans are, a lot of studies and emotion have taught us two things. One, humans are not very good, by the way, of coming in, of understanding their own emotions, which is why we go to therapy. Um, and secondly, humans are really not good at judging other people's emotions. And I, I was always shocked to find how, how difficult it is when you come to subtle emotions that occur in context, right? So uh, we said, OK, there's not great visible facial cues. Let's look at eye movements. Um, so in this case, so this is what, what, what you, if you track somebody's eyes, this is what you see. So this beautiful world we see in front of us is a total fiction. Uh, you're just sampling. Those red dots are the points you're sampling. Uh, and you're actually encoding and constructing this world. Uh, and in reading, for example, where we did this work, you know, there's a dance between how your eyes move and the, and the words on the page. But if you're not attending, that entire thing breaks down. So we developed AI models that could pick out when somebody was mind wandering through looking at eye movements that were about twice as accurate as human uh, judges. And what they would do is, as, they as, as you're interacting and you're zoning out, it would actually ask you a question. So if it thinks you're zoning out, it may ask you, give me a self-explanation of what you're reading. And based on your response, it would help you bring, you back to, bring your back attention back and help you reconstruct a response. We've also done this in the intelligent tutoring world uh, with tracking uh, eye movements of entire classes of students uh, learning biology uh, high school kids. So uh, very quickly, I just want to talk to you about some other ways in which we're using AI and te technology to understand more about uh, human thought and human emotions. Um, so this is work that couples eye movements with, uh, with kind of uh, neuroimaging, right? So typically, you have to be in a scanner. You, you can move. You can move your eyes. You can respond. But with new technologies, we're trying to understand, you know what? The eyes were fixated for a long period of time on this word. What's happening in the brain? Can we go and scan and see what, what's occurring? Are you zoning out? Or are you deeply processing? Are you generating inferences? So we're really excited to try to figure out how to couple behavioral signals uh, with what's happening uh, in, in the brain. We're also looking at going beyond single individuals to understanding collaborations. This is when things get really exciting. So imagine three people right here interacting on a really complicated problem. Uh, where they can speak to each other, and you're monitoring the process of how it's unfolding. Uh, if any, I spend about half my time in these types of Zoom meetings, uh, and you can see how, you know, you can, you can just basically tell, you, you can look and tell uh, what's working out, what's not. So imagine a version of Skype is what we're working on now, that an AI is sitting in the background and trying to model based on their speech, their language, how their eyes are moving, what good behaviors of collaboration are they exhibiting? Uh, and we're looking at three. Are they sh constructing a shared understanding of the problem? Are they negotiating and coordinate, coordinating with each other? And are they using things that maintain a good team dynamic? Uh, and, this, and we're working towards an AI who can interact accordingly. Similarly, um, we've been doing some work in understanding and improving couples therapy. Uh, so this is with colleagues at ASU. Uh, so this is a great, uh, a really fun experiment. They bring in couples, uh, and they've actually pre-selected them to have conversations on topics where one has a conflict and the other doesn't. And the idea is to train therapists. So they have conversations. And we find that by actually looking at uh, a big concept here is facial synchrony and mirroring, the extent to which the AI models can actually predict to what extent one person's eye movements and facial expressions can be generated from the others is turns out to be a really good measure of how these couples are in synchrony. So uh, with this information, the idea is to hopefully enhance these therapeutic um, outcomes. And lastly, uh, we've been uh, scaling up this work. Um, so one recent project I'm really excited about, our student sample is every kid in Florida uh, taking uh, Algebra 1 uh, in high school. And the idea here is in that state, you have to pass the Florida, uh, the Algebra State Standardized Assessment to graduate high school, right? Uh, and there's an online platform made available for these kids. But uh, frankly, it's videos and problems and kind of boring. Um, so we're actually seeing if we can do some kind of engagement sensing in this platform to come up with some kind of learning experience that is sensitive to each individual uh, and see if that can help these students uh, be in more, more engaged uh, and learn. 
Uh, so let me just end with a few thoughts uh, on, on these things. So as, as was alluded to by John earlier, you know, AI has always made tremendous strides on what I want to call well-defined problems. Uh, these are not easy problems, but they're well-defined. What object recognition? Is that a chair? Is this my face? Uh, chess. And these are typically, I would say, in the cognitive and behavioral domains. Right? So this has been a large part of AI uh, since its inception in the 50s. But as we keep using it more on these ill-defined problems, emotion recognition, collaboration, uh, social relationships, which are mainly in the emotional and social domain, it is a paradigm shift. Uh, and we have to think about the world in a kind of a different way. And in many cases, uh, the accuracy of some of our systems are actually close to humans. Um, so in the, in the case of emotion recognition, in certain cases we can tie with humans. In the case of mind wandering, we can really beat them. Um, and he, but, but despite this, you're far from perfection. So uh, I think this, we should be considering, uh, I'm, I'm one of, I, I embrace new technologies uh, if the work is done responsibly uh, and ethically. Um, and we want to be mindful of the sets of opportunities and challenges that arise. So here are the ones that I've been thinking about. Uh, there are clearly ones that are dealing with privacy and security of data and models. Uh, this is something to acknowledge and, 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 and build in from the ground up uh, and how you do the research. Um, the uh, issue that came up, the question was raised earlier about how can these models be transparent? How can people see what's internally going on in the model if the decision making of the model is influencing you directly? That should be a requirement uh, and part of your, your Bill of Rights. Um, uh, there's an ethical question. So do we really want to have systems tracking if somebody is mind wandering and responding accordingly? Uh, there is an ethical dilemma, right? How should you use this model? We already know that these models are not as accurate as they probably should be, and they're never going to be really accurate to the point of perfection. So should you make decisions, and what kinds of decisions do you need to make on a model that, frankly, is reasonably OK, but in our work, reasonably OK means pretty, pretty terrible, right? Uh, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> Um, and we've been, our approach has been looking at what we call fail-soft interventions. Uh, so the idea here is that we take action that's very, very subtle, that if you, get, if you make your wrong decision, you're not hurting the person. So in the case of the mind-wandering interventions, we would never say, you're zoned out. Uh, pay attention. Uh, we would just maybe ask you a question. You can choose to ignore it, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's kind of one of the ideas uh, we've been playing with. And, um, you know, uh, in a lot of this work, I've really got to learn a lot about humans and how they perceive emotions, their own and others, and how they express emotions. And, uh, you know, I think the question, by the way, of what is an emotion is one that emotion researchers have been asking since Darwin wrote, wrote some landmark uh, work on emotions almost 150 years ago. And we still don't know. Uh, and I feel these AI tools can give us a better understanding of what is an emotion. Uh, and if I might be a little provocative, um, what's so special about being a human? Uh, and I think Jonathan did a nice job of uh, getting us uh, started uh, along, those, along those lines. I think humans are very special, by the way. Uh, just, just, to, just, just put that out there. Um, thanks for your uh, attention. Take that into account in terms of the, the type of data, or the validity of the data, or the correlation of the data across multiple subjects. Maybe we could talk about that. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, we we have an approach. Oh, great. The question is in the context of eye tracking. Uh, if you have wearable eye tracking, there's, there's form factors and there's issues of accuracy. How do we consider the accuracy of the eye tracking itself? Um, uh, we, do, we do this in two ways. Uh, if we're doing really basic research on eye tracking in the lab, we'll use high quality devices, control head movements and such. But then we 
always take what we learn and put it in streamlined versions uh, in the wild, where we do not use high quality eye tracking. We use $100 devices. We have kids uh, set up their own eye trackers to make this more scalable. And some of the work I showed you with Mind Wandering uh, was done with uh, $99 pieces of equipment. And we just do the modeling in a, in a way that we do not require high, preci high precision eye tracking. So we look at features just like, how, how, how many fixations have you made in the last two minutes? How long are the fixations? We don't even care where you're looking, just what your patterns are. So, so that's how we address that challenge. Yeah? In my career in technology development, the best trainers, technical trainers, were always previous uh, kindergarten and first grade teachers, I think, because they could sense uh, when to jump in and when to back off. To what extent was your work prefaced by studying highly effective tutors? It's a great question. Um, the older work in tutoring was always with uh, novice tutors. Like I would be a novice tutor, peer tutoring. Um, the projects where we studied, we, we were funded by the Office of Naval Research to study these expert tutors, and we identified them as such. Uh, they have a degree in their field. They are well respected in the community. And you go to them if your kid is really in trouble and you have some money, because uh, they're expensive. Uh, and we, we videotaped them for about 50 hours, and we, we really investigated what they did. And the idea was to give that opportunity in a computer form for free to people who didn't have that access. Um, so these, and we identified some clearly distinct patterns between what novice tutors do, which basically follow a curriculum script. They have a general idea of how the tutoring session would do with the experts who at the moment do diagnoses, do training, do treatment. And, and the, the way they, the, the way they um, construct the tutoring session is so dynamic and so adaptable, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's a no-brainer as to why they get the results that they do. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So now, okay. Okay. Well, um, thanks, everyone. It's really nice to be here uh, this afternoon, in part because um, it was like Sydney, it was about 30 degrees when I left Missoula this morning, um, <laughs> so it was nice to come into the warm weather. Um, I'm going to be talking today uh, on our theme here of emotionally intelligent robots, more human than human, um, and my twist on it is looking at how children understand emotionally intelligent robots and the implications when robots appear to be more human than human. And um, <clears throat> it's nice to, to have this, uh, John talked about uh, having artificial intelligent devices, having emotion, Sydney about them recognizing emotion in human, and, and this piece is looking at how children are then looking back on these technologies and understanding them. So I'm gonna start with um, a story. Um, Several years ago, while I was in grad school at the University of Washington, um, my research group, led by Peter Kahn, had a collaboration with uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro and Takeyuki Kanda, who developed this robot, RoboV. And the project was investigating children's and adolescents' conceptions of this robot and uh, whether they thought that the robot had moral standing. And although for this project, RoboV can operate uh, somewhat autonomously, but for various constraints within this study, um, we had to control the robot from behind the curtain, which is referred to as Wizard of Ozine. Um, and at the outset of the project, I had made some sort of a remark that RoboV was, of course, just a robot and, of course, didn't have emotions and thought uh, was not a social other and certainly did not deserve moral regard. Um, and one day as we were fine tuning the Wizard of Ozine, uh, my, my colleagues decided to play a little joke and they drove RoboV up behind me while I was working at my desk. And, and they had RoboV say to me, Rachel, I hear you think I'm just a robot. <laughs> And I, uh, and I turned around and I said, oh, RoboV, I'm, I'm so sorry, you know, no, you're, of course you're not just a robot. Um, and I was playing my part in, in the joke and we all kind of laughed and we subsequently all turned back to our work. And RoboV was left standing there just over my left shoulder and I had this very um, odd compulsion to turn around and say, RoboV, I'm sorry, but I have to get back to work now. And of course I knew how the robot operated. 
And yet, nevertheless, it, there were, uh, it was giving me various cues that it was a social agent and that I slipped in in that moment. I slipped into thinking about it in that way. And part of it, I think, was the loveliness in, uh, in Hiroshi Ishiguro and Takeyuki Kanda's design of the robot that when it stands still, it's not rigid, right? It moves in the way that when we're standing still, as humans, we have slight, subtle movements, and, and RoboV has that. And I think that it actually can take really subtle cues where we will start to think about these personified technologies as, as having agency, as having uh, sociality, and as having moral standing. Um, as, as Sherry Turkle um, sometimes talks about it is that, um, that these devices push our Darwinian buttons, um, in part because we are social beings. It doesn't take a lot for us to think about other entities in that way. And research, a large body of which was done by the late Cliff Nass, has shown that adults, like me, <laughs> um, have this incongruence between their expressed belief about these sorts of technologies, my saying it's just a robot, and the actual interactions that we see people do. Uh, but now to turn to children, it's a really different story. So children, on the other hand, are really congruent in how they think about robots and how they interact with them. So here, um, here's a picture of some kids um, getting their photo with RoboV, and I'll highlight here that there's been a transgression. RoboV, in that little bit of subtle adjustments, has bumped this three-year-old, um, and as you'll see here, he demonstrates in only the way a three-year-old can um, his displeasure <laughs> um, with what has happened. Um, but he subsequently forgives RoboV for this transgression. Okay. And what we see with kids is that they think about these technologies in an entirely different way than you and I. Uh, they think about them as being sort of alive. And this is what my colleagues and I have referred to as the new ontological category hypothesis, this idea that children who come of age with these sorts of technologies will understand them in a fundamentally different way. And that understanding will not simply disappear with development. So I want to be clear, children know that, so we have uh, the robot now on your left and the robot Pleo on your right. They understand that these are technologies, that they are in no way biological. We ask them really fun questions like, can it pee or poop? <laughs> um, and yet they understand them as having a mind, as having emotions, as being able to think, as being capable of being a friend, and as deserving of moral treatment. So, for kids, these are not animate or inanimate, alive or not alive. Rather, they are sitting in this in-between space. And I'll tell you that we have found uh, in my lab, uh, in, in colleagues' labs, um, that children from preschool to late childhood hold these conceptions, this kind of having this constellation of characteristics that span these prototypic categories. Um, and in some cases, adolescents. Uh, but as, as kids are increasingly exposed to these technologies in their day-to-day -day lives, um, we may see this, this cohort effect, this bubble moving through in terms of how they're understanding them. And I want to emphasize that as I move, so these are looking at their conceptions, but what about their interactions? What about their judgments? So I want to illustrate how the way that they're thinking about these entities manifests in terms of their judgments and their actions. So uh, let me just set up this study briefly. Um, so we had a study using this robot Pleo. Children uh, five, seven, and nine years old interacted with the robot. Uh, and it's, as you can see, it's modeled to look like a little 
dinosaur. It's actually a one-week-old Camarasaurus, in case you were wondering. Uh, <laughs> I have a four-year-old who's really into dinos. Um, and so we, um, we introduced uh, participants to the robot, and then, um, and then we stepped out. As researchers, we stepped out, and we let them just have some free play for a few minutes. And so here's one participant, a nine-year-old, um, playing tug-of-war with Pleo. Yeah, so what he says, um, of course, is that, oh, you won that time. Nice job. Um, the child said that, yes. So, <laughs> the robot doesn't actually have language. It just makes kind of purrs and grunts, um, kind of animalistic sounds. Um, and what I want to point out is that the robot... Um, will we'll never win if the, unless the child lets the robot win. It doesn't have really strong uh, grasp on that, on the little toy there. And, and so what the child is doing here is, is moderating their own behavior and letting the robot win. Um, so why, why is that? So here, um, after the, pre, the free play time, the researcher would return and then ask a series of questions to get their, the kids' attributions. So we returned and we asked a series of questions about aliveness, um, whether they think about it as you know, having internal states, perceptual capabilities, um, sociality, and, and as I'm going to show you here, um, questions that tried to get at how kids thought the robot should be treated. And so we leverage here some of the design features of this robot. So if you hold it up by its tail, it will respond with increasingly agitated vocalizations and behaviors. And then we would ask participants whether it was all right or not all right to do that, to hold the robot by its tail. And here's what one participant said, but this is really, uh, il it illustrates what more, well, the majority of participants um, would say. Because that hurts him and that makes him shout and he doesn't deserve to be held by the tail because what could he do? What, would, what, would, what did he do to deserve that? <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and so I, what I want to point out here is that what this child, this nine-year-old child is, is doing is telling the researcher what they've just done is not okay. Um, and, that, and they're drawing on moral concepts there, right? In terms of the, the robot's welfare, that, that, he, that it hurts him, um, and he doesn't deserve to be treated in that way. So notions of, of fairness and justice. Um, and many children would subsequently pick up the robot, hold it, and comfort it um, to make it feel better. And so I want to... Um, I want to point out something that's really interesting about the pattern of results. Um, and that is that, as I mentioned, children understand these are pieces of technology. Um, they know that. They know they're not biological beings. Um, but those structural differences between computational and biological, um, it doesn't matter that they're different. They still can give rise to similar functions. And our participants would say things like, well, the robot doesn't have blood and bones, but it has chips and wires, so it can still feel. Okay. And these conceptions form the basis for social and moral regard that children attribute to these personified technologies. I'm, I'm running out of time. <laughs> so um, let me show you one last video. And what I, what I think is really interesting about this is that the robots are so pervasive now in children's lives that um, 
They are, they're seeing a broken down water heater and thinking robot. And um, indeed, uh, these personified technologies are not just in the lab anymore, but they're, they're in our homes. Um, and I just want to, you guys maybe know all of this, but just to point out here that, so in, in January of, of last year, 47.3 million adults owned a smart speaker. And a year later, 66.4 million. We'll, we'll get the new numbers, I guess, next January. Uh, they do them after Christmas, of course. Which means that um, a quarter of US adults uh, and more, I would presume at this point, have these types of devices. And so my final point is that context matters as we consider the potential benefits uh, and the implications. So certainly they are pervasive in our lives. Um, and as you've already heard, that there can be benefits in terms of uh, treatment for autism. Uh, this robot, Jibo, all the way to the left, has been used um, with, uh, for, as an intervention tool for children with autism, and that's really fantastic, promising work. And uh, we know that uh, these devices can be used as educational tools. In fact, you know, evidence that children will learn factual information um, from personified technologies. Um, and yet, the cautionary part is that um, many of these devices are being developed to be virtual friends and companions. Um, I have had parents share with me that they have an Alexa in their child's room to read bedtime stories so that the parent doesn't have to be in there um, to do this. Um, and, um, and we know from some of John's work that, um, that adults will divulge more information to a virtual therapist than they will to a, a, a human therapist. And so the question is whether children will view um, a robot as, as a confidant, um, as someone to turn to when, when issues of, of social or moral import arise, um, and rather than turning to a person. Um, and I think that the, the last thought is that it's important that we as scientists, as society, think crucially about the potential implications and the context of use of these technologies. There can be benefits, but there can also be downsides. And I think that we need to be aware of those, particularly as we look to the impacts on children's development and, um, and, and the role of these devices as potential companions, caretakers, and confidants. So I'll end there. Time. So I th think we'll just open it up broadly uh, to the audience for some final questions. And you've asked a lot of questions. So <laughs> Maybe if there's other people, and then if not, we can, uh, yeah. Um, so I've read a little bit about um, uh, issues with privacy in terms of like children's toys being developed that record the child interacting with the toy and then, you know, obviously the company uh, monetizing off of that private data, um, which also seems like, I mean, that's like a, that's, that's profiting off of that trust and actually like um, kind of breaking that, that contract of trust that the child has made. Um, do you have any suggestions about how that can be used like in a, in a morally sound way? Yeah, you, ra you raise a really good question. So um, actually there's regulations um, ostensibly to, to disallow that sort of thing without parent explicit parent consent. Um, and there's b uh, current revisions right now or considerations of COPPA to look at um, how do we do this with these types of technology. Um, I think that's a it's a huge issue, and I think it's I mean I don't have an I don't have an answer. I, I don't think that that's right um, that um, that that information can then be monetized and and to try to sell back. I mean, sell back devices or you know uh, whatever to kids. Um, so I don't I don't have an answer other than that I I hope that as we think about these new these contexts of use as the technologies are developed. That we can that we can think about how we want to how the regulation needs to interact with those things in order to protect kids. Um, so I don't know if you guys have other thoughts. So. 
Um, I, I would just say that it's, it's always, uh, it's, it's sad that it's always too late when the regulation catches up, right? There's always an incident. Uh, it's like if we had no red lights anywhere and once there's an accident, you start putting them in. Uh, so I, I think as society, uh, we have to really reconsider how we get the laws and regulations to catch up. Uh, and I don't have an answer, but I guess uh, I would say that uh, you guys, the youth, are the answer in, in figuring this out, um, along with us. But, but yeah, yeah. And I guess one thing I'll add is that um, in terms of privacy and disclosure, that there's often, it's not clear to the consumer uh, if there is a human. So as I mentioned, many people feel comfortable talking just if it's just a machine, and that may be problematic as well, but often people believe it's just a machine when in fact it is a human. So you may have heard, for example, you know, Google and Amazon hire out to subcontractors to read certain things, uh, and many of those things reveal who that person is that are not anonymized uh, in some cases. And even, uh, for example, there's some apps that use crowdsourcing. Uh, there's an app for blind people that it takes an image, people take an image of their credit card and then it turns out that a human will see that credit card uh, and transcribe it and tell them what the number is when the, people don't realize that there's humans uh, looking at information. And so it's, it's very complicated and the boundaries are not quite clear. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm glad you sort of turned it on, it, on, on that direction because that's where I was going to. Um, you know, that scene where the little girl um, went to, or the child, you know, comforts the robot. Um, and, and, you know, you said to make the robot feel better, but I think it's also to make ourselves feel better as, you know, <coughs> inside. And so to me, a lot of questions come up about, you know, as we as humans and how do we relate, um, even though it is a robot, you know, but so I was um, encouraged to hear that the younger generation has what you call this, you know, etymological or whatever it was you said. <laughs> the, the new ontological category. It just rolls yeah. off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that somehow, so I just, you know, I don't have a clearly formed thought, but I just know I have some sense of in the way that we as humans relate, and it, you know, and it kind of frightens me. Um, in that if, you know, we would ever deaden our empathy uh, because we're interacting, you know, but even though it's, it's a very human-like experience, but, you know, but it's a robot, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one thing, uh, so some of our workers looked at is, um, I mean, it's, there's definitely people are concerned that you might learn to treat other people worse because you're interacting with these things. But some things we've also found is that um, sometimes these robots satisfy human social needs such that we have a good, meaningful interaction with the machine and we feel less motivated to go out and talk to other people. Uh, and so there's a way in which, you know, we are social beings and we snack on sociality and when we're sated, we don't need to go uh, uh, engage with other people. And, and in some cases, these things may become substitutes for our natural human relationships. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's certainly a concern for kids that that it will this idea that if it becomes a replacement, um, then that becomes a obviously well maybe not obviously but to me that's a it, it's an obvious concern that if that's the types of relationships they're having because I think what's um, even if the AI is really, really good and much more sophisticated than what it is now, they they lack that authenticity, right? That there, we know that there, it's programmed. Like our kids will say, well, it has emotions. They're programmed emotions. They're still real emotions. They're programmed emotions. Um, so it's kind of this qualifier on emotions, um, and that that they aren't that it isn't the authentic. And and I think that that's. Um, something that's fundamental to human interaction is that piece of authenticity, and it's fundamentally it's lacking. I just want to add in real quickly at the end, I invited a, a girlfriend of mine to come to this panel, and she would have loved to, but she couldn't make it, and she's a philosopher student at another university, and she said, oh, too bad they don't have a philosopher on the panel. Yeah. So, you know, it's also like you were bringing up these ethical issues as well. So. There's a question. <laughs> um, you were talking about um, artificial intelligence and, uh, like, some of the examples you, you used are highlighting the, um, like incorporating vulnerable populations. So how is the data from these populations that are not the norm 
for whom DAI is created, how is the data being used or how are they protected differently from the, the niche that the AI was created for originally? Um, so I think there's a couple things in your question. So, I mean, one is how do you uh, protect the data from these particular populations, but the other is how do you make sure that when you then use technology that's perhaps trained on one population, how do you make sure it works on another population? Um, and at least for academic research, you know, we work with ethical review boards and there's issues about what, what can be shared and cannot be shared and, and companies have different rules and they're not always aligned. But the, the second point is you brought out is, is a, a real issue because many of these technologies, I mean, there's this concept in academic research called weird, which is mo most psychological research is done on Western, educated, uh, industrialized, industrialized, rich, rich and and yeah, yeah it's democratic institutions and, and doesn't necessarily translate to other populations. A lot of the techniques that uh, are trained to recognize emotion are trained on white psychology students, undergrads, <laughs> and they don't necessarily uh, pick up appropriately things of populations of color. So, I mean, those are important issues, and I, the fields are struggling through them, but I don't know that there's great answers yet. Um, one thing we, we do specifically is, uh, one of the things is you may, you may think you know how the data is going to be used today, but you do not know 10 years in the future. And when we're dealing with, spe specifically with young children, we take some precautionary measures. Like, we do not record video. Even if we can get permission and ethics, we extract the information we need while we're collecting data, and then we just don't store video. And, we, and I feel like these little things have been helpful to build trust uh, with the kind of the communities uh, we work with. Um, and and uh, it's a small cost to the research, but I think it's, uh, it's something to be done to protect uh, participants. Yeah, but I'll, I'll also add that as technology evolves, things that we often thought were anonymous mm -hmm. are no longer anonymous. So uh, now we can do, for example, if someone writes a letter to the Washington Post, you can do text analysis, and if that person has written other uh, documents, you might be able to say, hey, that's that person that wrote it. With uh, a lot of the data sets, researchers, we share a lot of data. We share anonymized data. Um, so rather than give the speech, we may give the features that were derived from the speech. But in some cases, when you're, if you're clever enough, you can actually re reverse engineer and figure out what the speech was from what you thought were anonymized features. When you collect data on Mechanical Turk, uh, which many of us do, often you can collect the IP address. Uh, and now I can, uh, if I know, okay, this is a woman because they filled out a questionnaire and this is their IP address, so there's only one person at that address that's a woman, I know who they are. So, so again, we think and we try to put protections, but as technology leaps forward, sometimes they're not as protected as we might think. Based, based on the sort of admissions of what you just said, um, you know, you don't know how your data is going to be used in 10 years, and there's always sort of uh, these ethical dilemmas. And what are the boundaries of such research? How do you know when you're approaching them? And then uh, when do you know when to say no? What do you think is a really hard thing for researchers? Like, because we're all, many of us in this room are researchers, and we don't like to, to hear no, and we don't like to not build things or design projects. And then finally, um, how does that intersect with sort of the increasing corporate nature of this type of research as those data sets become privately owned? So, um, so I'll just say that in terms of collecting our data, um, we keep it for a limited time, and that's laid out when uh, parents are consenting and children are assenting uh, to participate. Um, we get media, explicit media releases for they get to line item specify the type of use. So these have... I have permission from the to use these um, in this type of a setting. So we take those precautions very seriously, um, and I, I yeah. So I think I think that the issue of like how is that how is that data how do we maintain control of it? Um, it's it, it's it's a good one to ask, <laughs> it's a good one to ask, and I think also the data that's being collected, um, you know, as you're using your 
your devices, right? You have you have a trail of data that you're that you're leaving, and there and and there we don't we're not explicit about what that is. We don't know. It's not always clear. Um, and I think that, you know to Sydney's point, like we don't know how it's going to be used in the future. Um, when you know when companies have it and it and it's it's tremendous information, um, but there's no there's no regulation and even clear transparency on the part of the companies in terms of and for some of them more so than others in terms of how they're using it or how long they'll keep it. Like, how do you view your responsibility in those terms? If you know all these things to be the case, then what is your role as the scientist? And then where do let's say other fields like philosophy sort of come back in to inform the use? Um, I can give you an example. Uh, we did a project, uh, we are on a project with the intelligence research agencies where we tracked uh, for one year 757 individuals, uh, physiological data, social media data, right during the Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, location data, and all sorts of things. Um, and it, and it, it, it was to build a model, whatever. The, the reasons don't matter. And we actually had to do some pushback in terms of what we would share with the government. Um, these were people who completely consented. Uh, they were, I would never be in my own study in, in this case, I'll be honest with you. Um, but I also don't have smart speakers uh, microphone in my home. Uh, but but um, so people would share things and, and we actually had to have um, some difficult decisions and conversations with millions of dollars of funding uh, you know, involved. Um, and I was actually proud of our team and how we kind of negotiated that. Um, given that this was the government and the intelligence agencies and, and things like that. So, yeah. And I'll just say that, that ethical review boards don't answer your question, I would say. So there's many things you can get through an ethical review board that one might personally feel not to be ethical. So at some level, it you know really becomes a personal choice in terms of how do I you know do the work and there are strong incentives you know, in terms of federal dollars or corporate dollars to do the research. And so I think it ultimately comes down to, to personal moral decisions about how to do it. But the other thing, just to point your question that, and I don't have an answer, but it's troubling me, is that, you know, in AI now, you know, a lot of these things require big data. And we can't, in academia, afford to collect the data that we need. And so increasingly what you see is a real movement of research into industry because they're chasing the data. You can't do the work without the data. And often you don't, then those people disappear and, and you know, they're no longer your colleagues. And even within a company, they don't talk to each other. And, and, and so I think there's, it's undermining uh, our ability to advance the science. And I don't know how to get around that. I mean, maybe regulation where companies must make the data open, but then, you know, uh, that causes other issues as well. So I don't have the answers, but I'm, I am concerned about what's happening with the, the field. Um, maybe you and then... Just a very quick question and uh, a very quick comment. Rachel, in your, the Robo V and the illustration of the little boy that got bumped, and then he hugged, uh, for the forgiveness, I think, for the user, was that spontaneous or prompted? That was spontaneous, was yeah, spontaneous. yeah. There were no social cues in the context of <laughs> no, that, that was, that, for full disclosure, that was actually my uh, nephews and niece when they came to, <laughs> to see um, RoboV, yeah, and they weren't part of the study in any way, but yeah, they just, um, it, it was it was spontaneous, um, and um, yeah. <laughs> just a quick comment, Ben. There, there's, for me, it might be pedestrian to you folks, but there's a series on Amazon Prime called Humans that portrays synthetic humans and it addresses, like, the three of you might have been consultants today, <laughs> because it addresses kind of consciousness and the yeah. potential for emotion. It's actually, I highly recommend it. Yeah, there's a wonderful Swedish, uh, I bet it's the same title, but a Swedish uh, film that's, or series that's, that's very similar issues. What's it called? I forget. Is, uh, regarding consent, um, have any reviewed or are there any studies ongoing on uh, when people give consent, what they give consent to, how does it correlate with uh, their, their economics, their, their social status, the country they live in, uh, other kinds of factors. Uh, I, I know that uh, terms and conditions, hardly anybody reads. They're legalese and they're very long and, and it's impossible to derive the nuance of consent. There's lots of different aspects of consent. You mentioned big data, obviously. 
is the most important transitional, uh, transformational factor in creating AI-based analysis of, of behavior, human behavior and the like. And all of this big data requires lots of layers of tagging, of which much of it uh, needs to have uh, some sort of consent apparatus. Yeah. So how do you acquire the data that you need, tag the data that you need, uh, and where it's not anonymous, and, uh, and then utilize it in a way that it doesn't push back against people's uh, moral or ethical yeah. or social judgments based on what, what they really are giving consent to. Yeah, so the, 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 there's a lot of research on the problematic nature of consent. Uh, to, to our credit, uh, our, our university, IRB, is actually uh, pushed back on me in some cases where they felt like I was paying too much for a study and that would make the, the it coercive to participate in it. Um, and but, but then there's also research, for example, in terms of privacy that as soon as people are actually very concerned about privacy, but as soon as they find this device is useful, it's like, ah, screw that, I'm gonna, you know, I wanna use it. And, and that's, you know, I, I have lots of Alexas in my house and, and it's very useful. And, and at some point you're just like, you make this trade off, um, without really knowing what you're trading off because you find the thing to be useful. Yeah. Can we just, I think there's, I think we maybe just have one more question. Oh. Um, the subject of facial recognition was brought up um, before and uh, somebody mentioned, um, is it effective at recognizing <coughs> African Americans? Um, I believe that in nations where population is more homogenous, uh, that those systems have already been purchased and put into Usage. So I think that Nigeria has already purchased facial recognition Kenya has, uh, perhaps other nations in Africa, and they're not asking that question. They feel comfortable with it. Um, also, what you mentioned uh, with race and culture, uh, that most studies have been done on young white males, and, and I'm sure that that was certainly 100% true initially. But I think that we're not giving credit to nations that are moving up very rapidly. I mean, we can see that um, China is moving up very rapidly. India is moving up very rapidly. So surely there must be a lot of data at this point in time that is not quite real data. And I'm open to being corrected. Yeah, I think, I think that's accurate. I think it's always not, it's not always available to the, a given company, so like Chinese data may not be available to Americans, but I think it is it, it is a problem that people are now very aware of uh, and attempting to address. Um, and the issue is that um, it's not always clear. I mean, there's some technical issues about how to address it in the, in, a, in a way that doesn't cause problems, because um, often. Just to say that it's not a solved issue. There's a number of issues. Uh, there's issues that when you train data on what humans do, humans have biases, and so these algorithms adopt human biases. And if you try to debias them, sometimes those biases are there for actually statistically good reasons, and so then things don't work as well. Uh, so it's a it's a complex and thorny issue. But at least I think what's happening recently is it's now becoming. Uh, aware in the culture and there's organizations like AI Now uh, that in some cases are well funded to, to address this kind of uh, disparity research. So we have to end. And so why don't we thank our panelists and thank you all for, for coming.